This video is sponsored by Surfshark, the VPN that helps keep your information private. Hey lady, I'm ready to ride the mountain. Have you been drinking? Oh, you look terrible. We need to get you into makeup stat. I could have you killed. Hey, hello, how do you do? Shady Rags here. You knew this was coming. Ever since the John Redcorn video, everyone knew this was coming. It's time to talk about arguably the most despicable character of King of the Hill, Nancy Hicks Gribble. Peggy is still definitely the least popular for all the multitude of things she's done wrong throughout the series, but Nancy is pretty high up there despite having much less screen time. Now there was a behind the scenes debate of which episode I should tackle for Nancy. Hair Today Gone Tomorrow was my gut choice, seeing as how it's an episode centered around her affair with John Redcorn and is the episode I absolutely hate her the most in. I think you guys would get a lot of catharsis if I were to review that one. But overwhelmingly, Nancy Does Dallas was the most requested choice for a Nancy episode. Also, this will be the first episode I have absolutely no personal history with. I mean, I know what the episode is about, but I've never seen it, or at least I don't remember seeing it. So it'll be interesting to go into something fresh for once while doing one of these reviews. Now this is the part where I would normally give some context, but it actually isn't required for this episode. Uh, can I help you? Surfshark VPN! Wait, what? If you're watching this video, that must mean you have internet access, and people with internet access need to be careful of outside prying eyes. Hey, you can't just waltz onto my video and start saying, Hey look, green paper! Green paper! Doing things online without a VPN is like walking around while wearing a sign that tells everyone where you live. Your IP information is out there for all to see. Surfshark adds that extra layer of protection to yourself by just preventing DNS leaks. Hey, that paper wasn't edible. You're right. Let me apologize by saying that Surfshark is multiple devices with just one account. Look at that, one click and your secrets are safe. I feel like that wasn't an apology. Again, you're right, I was just trying to distract you. Distract me from what? Distract you from the fact that Surfshark has a multitude of servers, which is not only great for security, but allows you to view content you've been wanting to see that's region blocked. Wanna watch the Lego movie on Netflix but can't find it where you live? Well, just tell Surfshark you wanna be in Germany and bada bing bada boom. Ooh, they have a Batman one as well. I don't think that's really why you were distracting me. Also, why are you a plus sign? Well, I'm glad you asked that. You see, if you just follow the link in the description and use the code SHADY, they can get 83% off their purchase as well as three extra months free. And if you're not happy with your service, Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee. I mean, but I didn't ask. So sign up with Surfshark today. It'll help protect your information online and by using the channel's code, they'll know that SHADY sent you, which will help support the channel. Glad I could be a service, Mr. Durags. Wouldn't the mess just happen? Now this is the part where I would normally give some context, but it actually isn't required for this episode. Though I should mention that while this episode supposedly shows why Nancy is the most despicable character, it does not include anything about her affair with John Redcorn, the main reason most people hate her. If you want to know more about the affair, check out my John Redcorn video. No, that's not me trying to milk views out of you. What kind of money grubbing channel do you think I'm running? So the episode starts with Dale and Joseph getting into a food eating contest at breakfast. Continuity forgets Dale has the skills of a hot dog eating champ and has him choke on his food. Nancy nonchalantly saves Dale from his own stupidity and then immediately reprimands him for doing something else stupid. Dale, for the last time, you cannot store your poisons in the fridge. We keep our food in here. Again, continuity is a little forgetful here. Dale's not supposed to be using poisons anymore. This is all to display that Dale, on the regular, does crazy shenanigans, and Nancy is too used to fixing them. Shortly after, Nancy gets a phone call from her boss at Channel 84. A student at Durndal Elementary brought his pet possum to school. Did it bite somebody? No, it's a baby and it's cute. Go film it. <sighs> sure thing, Tom. In this town, cute is the most exciting news they can muster up, but Nancy's brain goes full Sharpe and insists that bigger is better and better is bigger. Well, I'm tired of cute. Cute doesn't win you a local Emmy. I'm bigger than possums, Shugs. Sue, so, I'm guessing this is where I'm supposed to start hating Nancy, given how much her ego is showing, but I gotta be honest, I can relate. I spent a lot of time doing jobs I was way overqualified for, and that frustration is real. Yes, Nancy should be thankful for what she has in her life, but that doesn't automatically dismiss the frustration of wanting more. Dale has the proper mentality when in these types of situations. Look for opportunities and make them work. But this could be big. Come on, you're a genius at making something from nothing. You made Joseph. I genuinely can't tell if that was meant to be a self burn or not. And it's even funnier when you think who Joseph's actual father is. This scene helps to answer a question I often get in my other videos. That being, if Nancy was willing to cheat on Dale for as long as she did, 
why did she marry him in the first place? As you'll see throughout this episode, when Dale is focusing on Nancy, he's actually really good at swooning her over. He genuinely thinks she's the most perfect human being on the planet, and when his attention is on her, he loves to remind her of that. Usually, however, Dale is caught up in his personal projects, making it easier for Nancy to see his flaws over his positive features. So, with Dale's advice in hand, Nancy finds a way to make this cute story more exciting. And how did you sneak oranges past school security? What security? Exactly. Wait, are they? Billy and Oranges stand here as a chilling reminder of the tragedy that could have befallen this school today. <laughs> they are! That wasn't even a story, it was just a bunch of ifs. Oh no, oh no! This was just supposed to be a fun video where I rag on Nancy. Things were not supposed to get political. Hike, what could have happened is often more important than what actually happened. You! The person eating while watching this video. This is your fault. You tricked me. You knew I'd never seen this episode before. You wanted this to happen. This is terrible. If someone could bring a possum to that school, what's stopping them from bringing one to mine? It's too late. It's already on screen. That means I have to talk about it. I have to talk about journalism integrity. Uh, do you have opinions on journalism and tech? Yes, obviously I do. So once again, King of the Hill proves to be ahead of its time by bringing up journalism integrity. The issue of whether those in the media are reporting the news in an accurate manner, or are they manipulating the reporting for other factors, specifically views. I'm pretty sure this problem has always been a thing, but man did it blow up in the 2010s. Seriously, with the amount of predictions this show gets right, I'm starting to think Mike Judge was precognizant. I can see the future! I can't say whether or not real news media outlets do this, because that would fall under a type of theory that YouTube doesn't like. But what I can say is that if there were companies doing this, this episode portrays why it's a despicable thing to do. As a result of Nancy's story, everyone in Arlen starts becoming paranoid that they could be under attack at any minute. This results in ridiculous behaviors like kids pelting people with books to practice their defenses. Now, obviously, if you report the news, how people react to it is not necessarily on you. But there's a different conversation when you're being intentionally misleading. And that describes Nancy to a T here. She's being intentionally misleading to the public, but doesn't care because her story is getting attention. My possum story is so popular, it got picked up by 12 affiliates. There we go. Now we're getting me into hating this character like I'm supposed to. You're gonna have to bump it up a notch though if you wanna see angry Shady. Now, for some reason, the writers decided to put this line in the episode. But this isn't about the glory. I'm just happy to be making the world safer in as many markets as I can. It's almost like they were trying to make Nancy have good intentions, but she accidentally strayed down a bad path. The problem with that is we already know from the beginning that she intentionally bloated the story for success, and this so-called concern is never seen again throughout the episode. So it makes very little sense and quite frankly shouldn't have been brought up. Hank is once again the voice of reason. Am I the only one who realizes that this story isn't news? And while in a standalone episode that's not bad, I do believe this happens to Hank way too much in the later seasons. Nothing wrong with Hank having the stronger moral values, but he shouldn't be flawless. When you have one character who's exclusively the voice of reason, that character feels more like a mouthpiece than anything. Anyway, eventually Nancy's story becomes so popular, it opens up opportunities she didn't imagine. Listen, I caught your classroom intruder piece and was very impressed. So impressed that I... I'd like to offer you a job. Now, you guys are probably gonna hate me for this, but I find everything in this next scene to be extremely wholesome. Nancy is excited to accept the job, but she's about to turn it down because her family's life is in Arlen. But she's interrupted by Dale, who's monitoring the call and encourages her to go for it. And Joseph, following in his dad's footsteps, also joins in. It's just a really nice moment where everyone in this crazy family, even Nancy herself, is more concerned about each other than they are themselves. Or at least, that's how I choose to see it. We do get some hints later that Dale might be doing this to get away with things. You know, Dale, just because Nancy isn't around doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. Uh, actually, that's exactly what it means, Hank. The point is, my Nancy hate at this point in the episode is once again very low. So Nancy decides to take the job in Dallas, but she's a little uncertain if she's up for the task. Oh, I'm so nervous. What if I can't make it in the Metroplex? You're ruthless. Remember when you paid that kid with Impetigo to hang out with your homecoming queen competition? Peggy, that's awful. Nancy? Are you sure about this? You know, leaving Dale alone? Dale will be fine. He can survive anything. He's like one of his cockroaches. God, jeez, I was dreading this day. Guys, for the first time I have to say, this episode of King of the Hill isn't funny. 
I mean, it might get a chuckle here or there, but it's a massive drop in quality from what this show normally delivers. Just look at this. Security breach. Joseph, sniff the bags. For that joke to work, they should have focused on Joseph's reaction more and faded out immediately after it was shown. There's too much time spent focused on him walking towards the bag. So Nancy makes her way down to Dallas and seems to be fitting in pretty well. She quickly starts getting along with the anchors, Wade Bixby and Gwen Shake James. Also the weather guy, but nobody cares about meteorologists. Nice job, Nancy. You looked good out there. Uh, what? Nice job, Nancy. You looked good out there. Hmm, yes. Uh, Gwen, try saying that one more time, but with this on your head. Nice job, Nancy. You looked good out there. Okay, now you sound in character. So, Nancy, every night we gather in my office for a little uh, post-show analysis, a.k.a. happy hour. Well, I guess I don't have to rush home to my family like I usually do after work. That line was a foreshadowing of both Nancy's actions and her downfall within the episode. Remember it, but not too tightly. I have some issues with the payoff. While Nancy's living it up in Dallas, Dale has been left without a babysitter, allowing him to do all sorts of things he normally couldn't. Dale, you giblet head, what are you doing to your house? Note to self, add giblet head to list of insults. Dale decides that because the second ice age is inevitable, he's going to freeze the inside of his house to condition his body for cold temperatures. When Hank reminds him that his wife probably wouldn't approve of any of this, he brushes Hank off and proceeds to get a walrus. Back in Dallas, Nancy begins to learn some interesting things about her new teammates. I hate that man. Wanna know how evil he is? Absolutely. Good gravy, woman, you just met Nancy. If Loose Lips really did sink ships, you'd cause five more Titanics. Every year the station sponsors a float for the Rodeo Days Parade. Wade, of course, gets one of the seats, and every year, instead of me, he picks his dog. You just made me hate Wade, too. Uh, why? Like, yeah, I do think that's pretty indecent of him to always pick his dog instead of his co-anchor, but I wouldn't necessarily describe it as evil. Most people like dogs and some really grow attached to them. Maybe it's supposed to hit worse because Wade and Gwen are having an affair, but she said they were doing that for ratings. They're not actually dating. Him choosing his dog is an inconsiderate thing to do, but not a particularly evil one. Gwen proposes that because he's evil, Wade be gotten rid of and be replaced by Nancy, to which Nancy happily agrees, because that's not an evil thing to do. Switching to the B story, Dale goes further down the rabbit hole with his plans while Hank continues to complain about them. Stop worrying about Dale for two seconds and tell me what you think of this one. Nancy was nice enough to invite Min and me to a fancy Dallas party. The least I can do is look good but not too good so Min doesn't feel bad. I'm guessing that comment made a lot of you angry, but it just puts a smile on my face. Comedic narcissism is my weakness. <sighs> I knew her leaving him alone was a bad idea. Vigilant! Uh -huh. This is a public service announcement. Never, ever, ever hide under someone else's bed. I did that in college as a prank. The things I saw cannot be unseen. So the fancy Dallas party happens where Nancy and Gwen do a little convincing. All right, guys, one of you rolled deception, the other persuasion. Oh, two net 20s. But maybe it would be best, you know, for the station, if Nancy and I represented KUMT on the Rodeo Days float. While on top of the world, Nancy eventually spots Peggy and Min. Now don't be intimidated by all these beautiful people. Inside, we're all the same as you. Nancy, what are you doing? That was Peggy's line. We've been secret plotting to get Wade Bixby fired. But what she doesn't know is that I'm secret double-crossing her to get her fired, too. Nancy, that's awful. Well, I had to get ahead, Shug. I've seen Nancy with her claws out before, but I had no idea she could be like this. Hold on. This whole operation was your idea. Peggy, weren't you the one who said... You're ruthless. Remember when you paid that kid with Impetigo to hang out with your homecoming queen competition? I mean, she's just doing the adult version of that. What did you think was going to happen? Nancy manages to get Gwen kicked off the float because Brett has an inside of negative 50, and she begins to celebrate. Meanwhile, Dale's shenanigans eventually lead him into breaking into the Hill's house for more electricity. He gets caught, however, by a paranoid Bobby and freaks himself out into an accident. When Peggy tries to tell Nancy about all this, she's too busy celebrating to even listen to what's going on. We finally get to the long-awaited parade, and... Nancy literally gets drunk on power. She's so intoxicated it causes her to fall off the float into a drunken stupor. Naturally, in a job where your image is your entire career and in an episode that wants its status quo back, this is a game ender. Clean out your desk, you're fired. Fired? Save it, sweetheart. You disgraced the mountain. 
Clearly, some people weren't made for Metro News. Grr, I am angry, Shady. I am so mad at Nancy in this episode, and I'm just so happy to see her get her just desserts. Grr. Okay, I can't do this. Look, I know Angry Shady is best Shady, but I gotta be honest, I'm not feeling the Nancy hate in this episode. I was completely on board when she manipulated the audience for her own gain, but that's not the focus of the episode, it's just the setup. The focus is how she's screwing over her co-workers in Dallas. The problem with that is, the episode makes it clear that Gwen and Wade are awful people as well. It's a lot less concerning when evil is being done to other evil people, but the biggest dissuading factor is how Nancy falls. Believe it or not, I actually feel sorry for Nancy after she loses her job. I know it sounds weird, but let me explain. If Nancy were a real person, I would 100% not care that she's getting fired here. Shoot, I'd even be happy. But as a character, I feel a lot more sympathy, and that's because of presentation. Looking at it from a storytelling perspective, there is literally nothing stopping Nancy from achieving her goal. A goal she, as a character, worked for. In order for the show to keep its status quo, it made Nancy fail due to her inability to control her alcohol. The problem with that is, alcohol being Nancy's vice wasn't properly set up. Yes, we do see Nancy drinking throughout the episode, and there is the scene of her getting drunk with her co-workers, but it's never foreshadowed nor forewarned that this might be an obstacle in her path. Drinking, or rather Nancy's inability to control her drinking, becomes a problem for Nancy only when the plot needs it to be. Someone saying something like, haven't you had enough? Anywhere throughout the episode would have been enough of a setup. As it is, Nancy's fall should have been related to how she was ignoring Dale, or how she was backstabbing people, because both of those are shown to be bad things that Nancy wasn't taking into account. Because the actual vice wasn't properly set up, I feel like the character was cheated out of a victory they rightfully earned. Again, in context of story. Yes, I know that Nancy is behaving villainous, but even a villain shouldn't lose because of bad luck in a story. It just makes me feel sorry for the villain. It's not that I want Nancy to succeed, it's just that I'd like her failure to be earned. And so, when it's revealed that Nancy learned absolutely nothing from her endeavor, I'll catch the eye of another big station by annihilating my competition. Oh, Miguel has plenty of skeletons. I'll systematically destroy him and then anyone else who gets in my way. I'm not really surprised. The show didn't give her an opportunity to learn anything. She never faced any consequences for the possum story, which got her to where she needed to be. And when she starts being awful in Dallas, she doesn't get caught lying, nor does someone more devious than her backstab her. She failed because of a stupid mistake, one that no one could have seen coming. Of course she's gonna try again. It's just this time, she'll avoid making the stupid mistake. As Nancy talks about repeating history and aiming for Houston, something interrupts her plans. Nancy, where are you? I can't reach the fire extinguisher and I need it. <sighs> oh, forget it. I'm too tired for Houston. Dale and all his nonsense keeps Nancy so busy, she doesn't have the time or energy to be like she was in Dallas. So Nancy needs Dale more than Dale needs Nancy. Not really how I'm reading the situation. I actually see it as Dale is holding Nancy back. But yes, technically speaking, Nancy does need Dale to not be evil. So the episode wraps up with another genuinely touching moment in the Gribble family as Dale reminds Nancy once again why she fell in love with him. It sure is great that you're home and not just for fire retardant purposes. I missed you. And that was the infamous Nancy Does Dallas, and I gotta be honest guys, I'm not convinced. Don't get me wrong, I don't like Nancy. She is an awful, disgusting person, and her actions within the episode are indeed horrible. I just think this episode in particular does a poor job of presenting that. The episode isn't paced well, too many jokes fall flat, and the inevitable downfall of Nancy is mostly due to convenience more than her getting what she deserves. It's kind of difficult to hate her for being a despicable person when we're constantly shown and told that the people she's conspiring against are also despicable people. I found her most hateable at the beginning of the episode, where she's intentionally adding a component of fear to her reporting just for the sake of views, but that moment is quickly forgotten and never addressed again. Also, when I'm thinking of how much I hate Nancy as a whole, I'm mostly thinking of her relationship with her family, but this episode goes out of its way to show how much the Gribble family mean to each other. Nancy herself is very considerate of her family's needs multiple times throughout the episode, so my original reason for hating her isn't present and these new reasons aren't properly established. I'm not saying Nancy Gribble is a good person. But what I am saying is, if you want to show people just how nasty she is, 
I think other episodes do a much better job than this. Thanks again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video, and thanks to Mr. Ad for... Oh, a plus sign ads thing! This has been Shady Do-Rags. So long. Farewell. Advita say. Goodbye.